corruption in elevated companies. Does it go all the way to the top? Which leaders are going down? It's the show with PJ Thumb. narratives been accused of being an agent of foreign influence. Tom and his partner Kirsten, who also met Dr. Mathir, they set up an organization called New Narrative, funded by a foreign foundation, significant funding, received other foreign contributions as well. Is it right for foreign funding to be received in order to advance these viewpoints. Meanwhile, Mr. Ong Ye Kang attacked Kirsten and me in Parliament and went out of his way to mention that New Narrative receives significant foreign funding. I thought I was the only person failing to be a comedian around here. Anyway, I agree. Foreign influence is a problem. We don't want foreigners coming here and taking over our land or telling us what to do. We certainly don't want to run our government using foreign systems like parliamentary democracy or British common law. We shouldn't speak a foreign language or have a national pledge that embraces foreign ideas such as democracy, justice and equality. We don't want foreigners advising on major policy decisions about sensitive things like our wages, or foreigners managing our sovereign wealth funds. We don't want foreign organizations educating our future leaders. We don't want foreign professors teaching our students. We don't want foreign influencers coming to Singapore and have them declaring that they want to get involved in politics. We don't want foreigners working in our security services and protecting our leaders. We don't want foreign funding for our local institutions. Li ka Shing, by the way, is the single biggest donor to NUS, $110 million. And we definitely don't want political parties which were started up with donations from foreigners, had foreign leaders present at their founding event, and which advocated for Singapore reunifying with the rest of Malaya. The worst thing, of course, would be for us to end up in a scenario where you say that Singaporeans should have lower wages and lower living standards in order to make sure foreigners can invest their money here and make profits. But Lee infamously said that if he could persuade another 10 billionaires to move to Singapore, he would, even if that led to higher inequality, quote, because they will bring business, they will bring opportunities, they will open new doors, they will create new jobs, unquote. Set aside for a moment whether you think that plan will work and just listen to what he's saying. He wants foreigners to bring their money to invest in Singapore. That's the definition of foreign funding. So, if you permit all those things, but then object to foreigners giving money to civil society organisations, then it's just blatant hypocrisy. The fact is that Singapore and our world is thoroughly globalised. Money, people, ideas, diseases, pollution like the haze, all move freely around the world and they don't originate in one place, but some from multiple places. To say that something is bad just because it is foreign funded is just stupidly simplistic. Instead of focusing on where something comes from, much better to understand it and understand why the funding appears and what it is trying to accomplish. 
Transparency and accountability and education, media literacy, are our weapons for countering forces which seek to spread and foment hatred and fear. By indulging in the language of fear and suspicion and citing allegations without any proof that Singaporeans like me are agents of some mysterious foreign influence, Mr. Shamugam and Mr. Ong Ye Kang are stoking fear and chaos and playing right into the hands of the very forces that they say they are seeking to suppress. While we're on the subject, if you'd like to know more about New Narrative, how we're funded, where we get our funding from, and what our aims and our agenda are, it's all on our website at newnarrative.com transparency. Or just email me, or attend our monthly online open meetings. We have nothing to hide. Today, I thought I'd go into this idea of foreign funding and explain its historical role in Singapore's economy, how it explains a lot of the problems that we face today, and most of all, how the PAP are actually powerless to do anything about it. I'm going to talk about this in very broad terms, so if you want more detail, please visit New Narrative. I've mentioned before how Singapore was a rich country during the colonial period. By the 1930s, we were the richest country in Asia and the richest city after Tokyo. Singapore was the most important commercial, transportation and communication center in the Far East, the biggest market in the world for natural rubber and tin, a specialized commodities future market, and a major world oil distribution center. But it was also a really, really unfair, unequal country. It was an exploitative colonial economy where there were few laws to prevent workers from being worked to death. Unemployment was high and labor was far more plentiful than capital, so productivity was low and we were ripe for exploitation. Why did this happen? It's fundamentally about maximizing the profits from your money, from capital. A simple way of understanding one of the main drivers of colonialism was that as workers gained the vote and laws were passed to protect workers in the West, profitability fell. Capital doesn't care about morality or humanity, it only cares about making profits. So it went abroad to find places where workers would work for cheaper, where there were fewer laws to protect workers. It's the same basic reason today why that smartphone you're holding was made by an eight-year-old in China. Fair wages and humane working conditions cost more than coolie laborers working 12, 14 hour days and sharing rooms with their entire families in Chinatown. The British called it free trade, but it wasn't just the trade that was free. It was also free of labor rights and other laws, and this allowed the colonizers to enslave workers and steal natural resources. Singapore was founded to facilitate that trade, first with China and then with the entire East and Southeast Asian region. Our prosperity was initially built on being a center of transport for opium, coolies, and arak. That's right, the reason we got rich is from drugs, slaves, and alcohol. And the vast majority of the profits are sent back home to the home country of the capitalists, not reinvested in our local economy. So you can imagine for poor Singaporeans in the 1950s living in squalor amid such wealth and technological advancement, the first chance they got they elected left-wing socialist parties to tackle all this inequality. First the Labour Front in 1955 and then the People's Action Party in 1959. So a huge reason why we think of Singapore as a success is socialist policies by these governments with the aim of ending discrimination and redistributing income in a fairer way. This includes the CPF, the HDB, healthcare, education and so on. This is what Singapore's success is built on, redistribution strong social welfare, fair wages. But we also needed jobs, and here the PAP recognized that we still needed foreign funding, foreign investment into Singapore to industrialize, to create jobs. So the first stage of this was from 1959 to 1965, where we industrialized by trying to manufacture things that Singapore was already importing. Import, substitution, industrialization. In a nutshell, build up local businesses to make the things that we are already buying so that these local businesses then can replace the foreign businesses and eventually remove or replace our reliance on foreign money. 
Reunification, merger with Malaya, and the formation of a common market was central to this strategy because it would hugely expand the size of the local economy and local market and build up a class of local capitalists who would invest in our country and would also keep the profits here to reinvest. This failed with Singapore's separation from Malaysia. Out of Malaysia, we no longer had a potential big internal market and we were cut off from a lot of domestic capital to invest in our economy. Unlike other Asian tigers, Singapore doesn't have a sufficiently large class of local capitalists. One reason is of course because we're a tiny country. Another reason is because the few local businessmen we did have also were happy to use their money to influence local politics, which made life difficult for the PAP. For example, take the businessman and philanthropist Tan Lak Sai, who founded Nanyang University and opposed the PAP's policy on vernacular education. As any citizen who disagrees with the government does, he donated to the campaigns of around a dozen opposition candidates from the Barisan Socialists in the 1963 elections. Donating to politicians, totally legal, totally normal. But in response, the PAP government stripped him of his citizenship and he was stateless for the rest of his life. Another reason why we don't have a big class of local capitalists is of course that our economy was never built that way. The only time we started trying to build up domestic capitalists was between 59 and 65. Once we left Malaysia, the PAP quickly abandoned that strategy in favour of a quick fix. Invite foreign money back in quickly, quickly, quickly. And so from 1965, the PAP launched a new economic policy called Export-Oriented Industrialization. Now, export-oriented industrialization itself was the correct policy. The issue is whether it was driven by domestic capital, as in the rest of industrializing Asia, or foreign capital, as the PAP chose. In Singapore, we use foreign funding as a shortcut instead of the slower but more sustainable path of developing domestic capital to support our economy. In some ways, this was a return to the colonial model. We invite foreigners to invest their money in Singapore and create jobs, and they manufacture things here and export them elsewhere and make profits. But there's no doubt it worked quickly. We pretty much achieved full employment in seven years by 1972. But it was unsustainable in the long run. And some people, of course, pointed this out and objected to this course. We had been controlled by foreign capital for decades, won our independence, and now you want to return to having foreign money dominate our economy? But the PAP government solved that problem by reason, debate and discussion. No, I'm just kidding. They locked everyone up who disagreed with them. Singapore was also lucky because around this time, international capital was running into limits on its profitability in their home countries, especially the USA. They were looking for friendly, stable governments to invest its money abroad because they wanted to avoid repeating the problems of the past where direct investment led to direct control, led to a colony, led to colonialism. For the same reason, many former colonies were very wary of foreign capital due to those same fears that foreign funding, foreign investment would lead to foreign control over their economies. But not in Singapore. Here, international capital found the perfect partner. Cheap, an ally of capitalist countries, a great place to make lots of profits with a stable government happy to facilitate this, and a government with incredible political and social control to guarantee that stability. And this is the basis of our rapid growth in the 1970s. Foreign funding just flooded in. By 1972, we had virtually full employment, but it also crowded out domestic capital. By the end of 1978, foreign investment accounted for 78.5% of total gross fixed assets in manufacturing. In the late 70s, wholly owned foreign companies produced over half of all manufactured exports. Companies with a majority of foreign ownership produced nearly 90%. Foreign Finance Minister Goh Keng Swee knew this was unsustainable. As Singaporeans got richer, as our living standards rose, we were going to become too expensive for foreign funding, foreign capital, and the foreign money would eventually leave. So, the PAP government launched a new phase of our economic development, Singapore's second industrial revolution. 
they sought to move Singapore up the value chain from low-wage, labour-intensive manufacturing to become a high-wage, capital-intensive, high-value-added economy. They imposed mandatory higher wages, incentivized high-tech industrial capital, intensified domestic control, and reduced social spending. And it sold this to the people as Singapore moving into a new stage of our development. Our initial nation-building period is done. We are now a high-income country and are going to rise to the top. Remember in 1984 when Go Chok Tong said we were going to have a Swiss standard of living by 1999? Well, by 1985, we were in the midst of a huge recession. Without the profitability, foreign capital simply left. By 1985, GDP growth plummeted by 10% in a year. Labour costs had ridden by 40% since 1980. There was hardly any technological upgrading, a 40% decline in investment and collapsing demand for Singapore's manufactured goods. Basically, the PAP said, you're fired. And foreign capital said, you can't fire me, I quit. In political terms, this state-sponsored revolution founded because the PAP tried to unilaterally alter the terms of its alliance with foreign capital. It's a political move to extract better terms from your partners, but you can't shed your low-wage intermediate technology role using legislation and regulation. And Singapore has no leverage. It is not China, which has the world's largest market. So capital simply moves somewhere with greater profitability. Okay, if you didn't quite get that, Here's another way of understanding it. The PAP government tried to do this. I am altering the deal. Pray I don't alter it any further. And in response, foreign money said this. Oh, screw you guys. I'm going home. But Carmen, we're trying to... Uh, screw you guys. Home. And this left the PAP government like this. So the PAP government caved in. They abandoned the second industrial revolution and returned to a low-wage export production model through wage freezes, changes to the tax code, but also cutting employer contributions to pension funds, to your CPF. Okay, so if you're not Singaporean, the last one might need explanation. Our pension fund, CPF, is made out of two main components. Your contribution, which has been as high as 40-50% of your salary, and your employer's contribution, this whole, con whole thing is taken from your salary every month. So the government can impose a wage cut on the whole country and correspondingly increase business profitability simply by cutting employers' contributions. Now, the wage cut worked because fundamentally the problem was not that wages rose, it was that they rose too fast ahead of productivity. So cutting back and recalibrating was the right choice. Full employment was regained by the end of the 1980s. But the PAP also abandoned the second industrial revolution. Even if it was the right path forward, they were not willing to pay the political cost. And then came the next big mistake. In the 1990s, with the end of the Cold War and the dominance of the neoliberal consensus, the PAP began to let in massive quantities of unskilled labour. Between 1990 and 2010, over 1.2 million unskilled and semi-skilled workers were added to the economy. This massive availability of cheap labour depressed real wages and disincentivized firms from mechanising or using technology or reorganising to raise labour productivity. Instead, labour-intensive operations were artificially sustained by cheap labour for the next 20 years creating an underclass of the working poor at the bottom 10% of the workforce. Why? Because it's easier to add and exploit cheap labour than it is to do the hard work of building up productivity. In Singapore, low-cost foreign labour are exempted from the laws regulating labour and wages. They're paid as little as $10 or $20 a day in a country where our government considers you extremely poor if you make double that. These are our modern-day coolies, our modern-day slaves. Because of this disastrous decision, we lost 20 years of steady real-wage growth, which would have realised our dream of a Swiss standard of living for the working class. So instead of our dream high-tech economy, we have a low-tech, low-productivity economy that is based on exploiting cheap foreign and domestic labour. 
And on top of all of this, we still never developed a viable domestic capitalist entrepreneurial class, as was the case in the rest of developed Asia. Go King Sui's nightmare of being dependent and vulnerable to foreign capital has thus continued till today. All other developed Asian economies, including now China, have bravely, successfully and wisely developed domestic entrepreneurial capacity, domestic capital. But we became complacent because foreign capital dominated development was so quickly successful that it became an easy soft option for us. And this is the crux of the problem today. Singapore's economy today is one that relies on foreign investment, foreign funding. So the PAP bends over backwards to accommodate this foreign funding. This is where Singapore's low tax, low regulation reputation comes from. For foreign companies, Singapore is very low tax and low regulation and also low wage. That's how they make their money. That's how Singapore competes. But for us Singaporeans, of course, Singapore is high tax high regulation and low wage. And all this suppression of wages to maintain competitiveness has caused a lot of unhappiness. And rather than take the difficult choice of developing our domestic entrepreneurial capacity, our domestic capitalists, the PAP chooses the easy way and deals with our anger by cracking down on dissent to silence us. And to justify that oppression, it measures its success entirely on measures like GDP, which is simply a measure of the total transactions in an economy, nothing to do with our living standards or actual well-being. And the strange thing is that the PAP government could easily afford to redistribute profits and expand social welfare, but it won't. And I can only surmise, based on the public statements of our ministers, that it is because the PAP government remains trapped in a simplistic neoliberal form of thinking, which believes that welfare is bad, and corrupting and inevitably leads to unsustainable fiscal outcomes. Minimum wage also discourages upgrading because their income is guaranteed by the minimum wage so there's no incentive for them to upgrade. And this of course flies in the face of all empirical evidence including our own history. And it's doubly ironic because as I explained in the previous two episodes the PAP government actually tightly controls our social and political lives. So on the one hand, they say to us, listen to the government, do what we tell you because we know what is best for you, don't protest. And then on the other hand, they say, you must be self-reliant, social welfare is bad, we cannot have a crutch mentality, you must take responsibility for your own life choices. Well, which one is it? Either you let us make our own decisions and let us face the consequences of our own decisions, or you control our lives and then you also take responsibility for what happens in our lives. The PAP wants to have it both ways, control our lives but no responsibility when things go bad. Well, you can't eat your cake and have it too. So how do we break out of this economic model? Well, the easiest and fastest way is actually reunification with Malaysia. This is one reason why the PAP pursued merger and why Lee Kuan Yew to his dying day hoped for reunification a combined market and a vastly expanded class of domestic capitalists who would reinvest their profits in the country instead of extracting them would solve a lot of Singapore's economic problems straight away. Singapore's economy is bigger than all of Malaysia's. In a reunified Malaysia, Singapore would be by far the richest, most populous, most powerful state. Singapore would rule the reunified Malaysia. This has been why, since reunification was first proposed in the 1800s under the colonial government, it's always been the Singapore government which wanted merger and the other Malayan states which opposed it. So, that's unlikely to happen. And short of that, is there anything we can do? Of course there is. We have the resources. Singapore has plenty of smart people who can figure something out, given time. We have plenty of money. However, various economic restructuring committees that have been formed over the years, like the Economic Review Committee 2001, the Economic Strategies Committee 2009, the Committee on the Future Economy 2015, remain trapped in this outdated neoliberal form of thinking. So it is unlikely that the solution will come from the PAP government. More importantly, the last time the PAP tried to solve the problem, they found their hegemony threatened and they promptly backtracked and returned to the old model. Solving our quandary is not difficult, but it requires political courage, 
a willingness to release their tight grip on power, and long-sightedness. Three traits which are sadly lacking from the current and next generation of PAP leaders. Indeed, the only truly innovative and groundbreaking ideas for our economy have come from outside our government, including opposition political parties like the Singapore Democratic Party and the Workers' Party, public intellectuals like Donald Lowe, and independent economists like former GIC chief economist Yo Liam Kyung. I suggest that you check out Mr. Yeo's videos from the Future of Singapore discussion group. I think it says a lot that he was never able to push these ideas forward when he was within the system and is only able to talk about them now that he is out. The videos are linked in the description below. There is another crucial reason why the PAP is unable to depart drastically from existing policy. It's to do with Mr. Lee Kuan Yew himself. The PAP is haunted by a ghost, the ghost of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. And until it successfully exorcises that ghost, it will be trapped in the past. I'll explain this in the next episode, where we talk about Oxley Road. Hello, this is Grouchy the Malayan Sun Bear. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe and please share with your friends. Also, please help us make more by becoming a member of New Narrative. It's only 52 US dollars a year or 5 US dollars a month. Imagine how much honey you could buy with that. Learn more about us at newnarrative.com slash hello. Thank you very much.